everybody. Thank you for joining us and welcome to this webinar tonight. Now within our Mortal Life community, it's so important to hear the male perspective on living with childlessness. And tonight, I'm so excited about this because we're extremely lucky to hear this from Rod Silvers. Now Rod is an actor, a former market stall tra uh, trader, stand-up comedian, He's sometimes funny, and he's often intertwined his childlessness with his work. Welcome, Rod. Evening, Eva. How are you? It's lovely to have you here tonight. Thank you for having me. <laughs> now, I just want to say that Ron, Rod's had a really, really busy day, and he's really lucky to get here tonight, and he's gone through a lot of trouble to get here tonight. So an extra big thank you for that, Rod. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Ev. Now, we're going to begin this webinar tonight with Rod's yeah. presentation, and then we'll move on to a short Q&A session. Now, any questions that you may have can be typed in as we go along, and we'll come back to them to visit them after the presentation when it's finished. Now, to submit questions, simply hover your cursor down at the bottom of the screen and a toolbar should appear. If you click on Q&A and type away and just submit your question, now, please make sure that you select the anonymous function, and this is just to prevent any personal data being disclosed, as this session will be recorded and watched by others later. Okay, right, I think I'm gonna disappear now. I'm gonna mute myself, and I'm gonna leave you in Rod's capable hands. Thanks, Thank Rod. You, Cheers. <laughs> this is really strange talking to a camera like this. I do talk to myself a lot, but not into a camera, normally privately. Um, thank you, Eva. That's very, very kind of you. And good evening to everyone out there. Um, 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 well, um, as Eva said, my name's Rod Silvers. I don't know if it looked there or there. I'll just try there. Um, my name's Rod Silvers. I'm uh, uh, an actor. Uh, and a writer, um, um, not the best, but I do my best, I try. Um, and I'm involved in this community now, I'm very honoured to be so. Um, I, I got involved because around about 10 years ago, put a little less, I wrote a film called England Expects, and it's all about one man's journey of IVF. And basically, I wrote it um, using football uh, as a metaphor to explore hope, loss, and expectation. And notice I tried hope, and not hope. I'm just trying to speak clearly, so just go with me on this. Um, yeah, to explore hope, loss, and expectation. And the reason I used football is because when, uh, when I was growing up, where I grew up, football was everything. And it was the only place you could really go to where um, you saw men showing real emotions, um, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. You know, the language could be a bit colourful, but we all know that. But it was the one place I used to go to where you see men, you know, really showing emotion, expressing their feelings. Um, and also the other reason I wrote it is because of the, my own journey I went through, well, two journeys of IVF would be worth. Um, and, Looking back, um, well, at the time, what I actually thought, the reason why I did it is because um, I wanted to give some kind of voice to childless men, because um, there was kind of nothing out there. And after the journey, I felt I needed to do something. Um, so I wrote this film. It's not the best film, but I didn't really do it uh, for creative purposes. I did it because I needed to do something. Um, so I parked that there. Um, and then around... Uh, 10 years, again, nine, 10 years later, um, I started writing a play, um, which uh, I put on last year. It was a two-hander, which I wrote and produced, um, and I wrote the theme tune. Um, no, I didn't really. I can't write any tunes. Um, I can barely write. Um, and I wrote this play called Terry and Jude, um, which was a two-hander, a comedy, which was about two older, single, childless men in their 50s. Um, and I just had suddenly, this feels like Ronnie Corbett. Anyone who used to love the two Vons, legend, the dear little Ronnie Corbett sat there doing these funny gags. 
although this ain't going to be funny, and there's no gags, um, and I'm nowhere near in his class. Um, sorry, I just went off on a tangent now. But yes, yeah, so I wrote this play about two older single child spending in their fifties, and the story is um, one man in his desperation to have a kid uh, makes the other an offer he can't refuse, um, and it all goes a bit pear shaped. Um, now this might sound like a very strange thing to say, um, but whilst I knew why I wrote the film, I didn't quite realise why I was writing the play. I was just writing it. Just came to me. I started writing it. I want to write this play about two older men that can't have kids. Um, and I thought that's it. I'll do the play. Hopefully people come see it. They'll have a laugh and they'll go. Um, but what it actually did is it took me on a bit of a journey, a bit of a voyage discovery as a now an older single man, um, which I'll come back to, which is what I'll explain. And in order for me to explain that journey, I need to go back a bit. I need to go back a bit in time. Um, we're all different. People are different. Um, and this is just my journey. Now, where uh, I was brought up, um, very kind of poor, working class community, um, my family, uh, I didn't come from any kind of, I came from a family that's very dysfunctional, there's a lot of mental health, uh, bits of abuse and even a little bit of death thrown in. So it was a happy ass, it was an happy ass. Um, and, you know, we were one of those working class families, just get by, go to work, come home, bush, try to live. Um, so growing up, there wasn't a huge amount of structure. And I say this, by the way, not for a sub story. I say this just to give it some gravitas of where I'm going with this. Um, so we were, yeah, we were a pretty dysfunctional family. Um, and you had to just do what you had to do to survive. And there were three things that really stuck with me when I was a kid growing up. Um, and I wouldn't call them values, right? Um, I'd call them kind of beliefs. It was what all lads used to do back in them days. I'm not saying they were right, obviously times have moved on. This was the 1970s and things were very, very different back then. Um, and those three things were this. Um, one is that men don't talk. If you talked, you got slack. End of. Men didn't talk. It weren't a dumb thing. You just got on with it. The second is, and what you could do, is you could fight. You could definitely fight. Um, which is pointless for me, because when I fight, I do just look like an hamster running around a wheel like this. You know, it really is like that. It's ridiculous, honestly. I mean, you, they should do a program on it. It's so embarrassing. So you can fight. And the final thing um, you could do, um, and forgive me the way I put this, but it was look after your woman. Support. Be a provider. I know that sounds now in 2019, right? But that was the dumb thing. You looked after. So you didn't talk your fault and you looked after and which is why I kind of used uh, the football as a metaphor for things to expect because you did see a lot of talking uh, when I when I say talking I don't mean talking feelings I'm talking about band language and you said look saw a lot of fighting in footy back in the 80s um, and definitely support because you supported your team and that's the way it was so those were the kind of three things I took away me back in the day um, and when I left home I, you know, you would all do what you do, you, you try to get by, um, and things weren't perfect. Um, I try to do things right, uh, I got a lot of things wrong, uh, I still don't. Um, but at the same time, I always knew as a kid that I had this little kind of voice in my head that wanted to do something with life, something. I didn't know what it was because there was no structure to it, so I didn't know really what I was doing, but I was trying to do my best. Um, and I left home, got by, and I said, I got into trouble, and, but did some right things. Um, and I did start to talk a little bit as well, because um, I felt I needed to. I want to educate this ignorant mind, so I tried. Um, and then, at some kind of period, I got to know a dear woman that I know by the name of Sandra, Sid, who's my sister, Sid, that's her there, tattooed on my arm. Um, and... When we were growing up, we never really talked uh, as kids, but um, we started to get to know each other a little bit, and it's kind of nice because we started talking and opening up a bit. Um, the unfortunate thing uh, is before it could, I don't know, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Before it could develop, 
um, unfortunately, she had an illness and um, died, passed away. Um, and whilst that was difficult, I thought, well, okay, hold on a moment. You've got to take something out of this. She was a strong, tough woman that, you know, tried to survive and tried to do her best. You've got to take something away from this. Um, and I thought, yeah, come on. you only got the one life. Try and do something about it. Are you just, just be this kind of feral kid? Or are you going to try and do something with this small brain of yours and try and educate this mind? So I started doing that. And I started to question things and start to talk a little bit more. And thought, well, you know, this is all right. I'll give this a go. And I think because of that, um, I've opened up a little bit more. And then I was very fortunate um, a couple of years later to meet this amazing woman. And this amazing woman, and I'll always say this, completely not just changed my life, she saved my life. She genuinely did. Um, and she's very different from me. Um, although she must have had mental health problems because she made this, she married me. What can you do? You know? Thank God for that. Um, and so, yeah, uh, we got to know each other and got married. Um, and she was very different to me, you know, uh, class act, uh, very open, talked a lot. Um, and we certainly did communicate. Um, but see, I'm a bit of a deflector because I used to love to talk about her, but I didn't really like to talk about me. Because going back to my so-called beliefs, that was the thing. You don't talk about your man. You don't do that kind of thing. But anyway, I digress. Um, I almost want to do a little Ronnie Corbett gag there, but I won't. I digress. And I don't know any gags. But anyway, so. Um, and then we got together. And um, lovely woman. And eventually we got married. And like some couples do, we decided to we want to have a spog. And um, we tried. Um, the usual way, <laughs> I won't get into detail, um, but unfortunately it didn't work. So we did what um, some couples do and we went down um, the IVF route. And um, uh, two things that came up before we started. Um, one was, um, she was slightly older than me, um, and obviously that reduces chances, but also my boys and girls weren't moving as quickly. Um, uh, I think they'd done a bit of a backpuss, or they were in a backpuss moment, basically. They were just asleep on the sofa. So what I did is I gave them a pay rise. I said, come on now, people. You've got to do this for me. I took them to Hamleys, took them shopping game. I did everything for them. You know, I mean, honestly, I took them to a villain in Spain. And they did. They started a move. They got going. They got there. They went over the top, basically. They went out. So um, we tried the first... IVF round and I was going into this thinking, oh, I'm not too sure, I don't really want to talk about this kind of stuff. But anyway, we did the first one and it didn't work. Now, the thing, this is where it's starting to go a bit pear shaped and go to struggle already. Um, I couldn't really talk about it. Um, but after that first one, there was the biggest thing that came out of it was that um, I had to stand now because it is a lot older for the women. Um, maybe I shouldn't say that, but that's just how I feel. Um, the biggest thing for me was watching your wife getting beaten up and you not be able to do about it, anything about it, um, because this is science and it's IVF, and it, 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 there's just nothing you can do. Um, so my so-called beliefs, going back to my beliefs, I mean, already I weren't talking, but now suddenly I'm watching my wife getting beaten up and I can't fight. So that's my second value, Dan, second belief, Dan, sorry. I couldn't talk. Couldn't fight. So after much soul searching, um, we thought, all right, well, let's uh, give it another go, see what happens. Um, and that, the one thing that occurred to me as well was that um, because my voice was starting to grow a little bit, and after Sid and everything, um, even though I'm glad I didn't have to talk because I didn't want to talk, I did think at the time it would be lovely if someone asked how I felt. Because um, when you can talk, it's easy, because you're going to get your automatically spelled. So when you're someone like me who can't, uh, you think, well, which I know is how patronising that sounds for someone who don't want to talk, but I thought it'd be nice to be asked. So anyway, um, we gave the second one a go. Um, and again, um, it didn't work. Um, and having to watch her boat race uh, when you're on that phone, when you get that call saying it ain't working again, it's not a nice place for those of you who have been there. And because of that, um, there were consequences. Um, and amongst them, 
many other things. It's not the only reason, but um, we ended up eventually divorcing. And it ain't because we couldn't have a kid. It's just because it's what the process did. It was the consequences. It's all that emotion and, you know, and it knows diving. So then going back to me so-called beliefs, I already couldn't talk and I couldn't fight. And now suddenly um, she goes her way and I go mine and I feel like the biggest numpty in the world. Suddenly I can't support anymore because I've lost my team. My team's gone. So my so-called free beliefs are out the window. And I'm thinking, right, well, okay, um, that's happened. What do I do now? Um, so I, uh, yeah, I did a bit of research. I Googled it. Those are my Google hands, by the way. If it's a typewriter hand, it'd be like this. That's how typewriter works. So I Googled it and um, basically there was nothing out there. There was absolutely nothing out there to look because uh, my head was all over the shop um, and I didn't know what to do. So I thought, well, there's nothing out there. You know, you write a bit, um, you act a bit, um, do something. So I wrote a film and I wrote in the dead specs and um, I put it out there. And to be fair, I was sort of the best film in the world, but that weren't the reason I was doing it. But I put it out there and, and you know, at that time, this is, you know, almost 10 years ago. Um, there was nothing. Um, and there was no real reaction to it. There was no real reaction. I don't think people, uh, it's an unfair, possibly an unfair to say, but I don't think people were ready to hear it. Um, so I did the film and parked it, just left it. And then I thought, well, all right, what choice you got? You've got to get on with life and get on with it. Um, so that's exactly what I did. Um, and it's helped, it's helped, it's helped to, uh, you know, open up a little bit more because I like to think that it's educated this mind and I've, I've done a few things um, with your life because sometimes you have no choice, you just got to get on with it. Um, but then, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I just started writing this play. And as I said to you, I don't know why I was writing it, but I just started writing it. Mm, okay, I love comedy, it's, I love doing it, I just keep writing away and then, Eventually, we got it on last year, and um, quite a few people come to see it, which was lovely, which was nice. And I'd say of that audience, about 98% were women, and about 2% were men. Um, and I remember thinking at the time, well, that's a bit disappointing, only 2% are men. And I thought, oh, done well, there's older, right? Well, we're built in a day. And it's something, 2% to come. And I thought, you never know, you know, 2% of those men could be out working or seeing mates and no mates, they ain't got kids. And it might, they might just have a different perspective or should I say, see a different perspective, something they've never thought of before. Um, and certainly I've had people tell me a lot, a lot of people tell me, men and women, I've never ever thought about it. So I thought, well, you know, that's all right. 2% um, of men. And then a short space of time later, um, this is why I'm going to go back to the play, is that I went on a journey with this. Um, I did an article for The Guardian, um, and I remember talking to the lovely journalist, Baby. Um, she was asking me questions about the film and the play, and I loved it, um, absolutely, because like, I went into actor mode, you know, my love, you know, my voice changed, and I started doing this, and, you know, you can see a full head of hair. Um, I wish I had, it's a long time ago. Um, and I love talking about the play and the film. Um, but when she got onto the actual journey, uh, my journey of the IVF, um, that's when I started to clear about, struggled. I was like, no, 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 I'm a geezer. I'm against that. I don't do that kind of thing. I almost did a whole Mickey Flanagan walk. I'm, I'm not saying that's sad, Flanagan walks, but it's a fine impersonation. Um, I was like, no, 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 darling. I don't do that kind of thing. Don't do talking. And all I did was revert, revert straight back to the past because I just can't do this thing. And I was, I was quite surprised by that, that I couldn't be that open. And the truth is I probably never will be. I love talking, but I don't think I'll ever really want to talk about the journey. Um, for whatever reason that day, whether it's grief, or whatever, it's just some, it's just a bit too much for me. Um, so I climbed up 
when she started asking about my personal life and the journey. Um, um, and I thought, what's that about? And what's that about? What would you do? And then in this, in my head, I started realizing what this was about. Because about a week later, I got a tweet. I got a tweet from a fella. Um, it was quite nice. It's a long time since I've had a tweet from a fella. <laughs> you know what I'm saying now? Um, no, 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 let's keep it clean. I got a tweet from a fella. And uh, he said, um, uh, I didn't see your play, but um, because of what had gone on, he had, he had, uh, had a bunch of the film, he'd watched the film. And I thought, that's it. I've done it. That's exactly what I set out to do all those years ago was to let other men know, childless men, that they don't have to be on their own. You know, they don't have to have the same feelings I do. And, and I was chuffed to bits because I'd reached one fella. And I thought, that'll do me. My work is done. But then after the tweet, I had this, this tsunami of a wave of really self-indulgence went through me because I realised um, I got another wave of emotion, which is that... Um, Actually, I got another feeling, but it wasn't about any other fella. It was about me. Um, and I suddenly kind of, this might sound a bit cliche, everyone, but um, I suddenly realised um, I wrote the play not just for other people, I wrote it for me. Um, and the realisation of journeys that um, uh, I still feel it after all these years. Um, and the truth is, um, it don't go away because there ain't no closure. Um, it's just how you deal with it. Um, and as someone who acts badly and writes badly, um, that's my way. Um, but then I thought, okay, well, hold on a minute, right? Um, what was this all about? What really was this journey all about? Um, there's no closure, what do you do? You've got to have learnt something out of it. Um, and I have. I have. And what I've learnt is, going back to the old journey of the IVF, there's a few things. Um, going back to the film, I realised um, part of the reason why I wrote it, this is my learning now, why I wrote it, is because, and I'll tell you something, I've never told, other than when, when I did the, the Barbican Festival, um, that I didn't even tell, that, uh, tell my dear lady wife, is I hated myself. Absolutely hate myself when it didn't work. And I hate myself, uh, not because I couldn't have spoke, you know, I've been through worse things in life. And I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to denigrate anyone that feels strongly as that. Um, I hate myself because of what I did to her. Um, me, I can live with, I can do with most things. But I hated the fact that I took that girl down with me, that I ruined their life. Um, and that was the feeling I was left with, which is why I did the film. And then all those years later, I think they sat with me and it always has. And then I did the play and, you know, did the journalist thing and had the tweet. Um, and then I had this wave of emotion about me. And actually, I started to feel, because I did the play, I've met all these other people, amazing people, you know, amazing community of people, like the legend that is ever with him. Take it ever, take the compliment, um, Jessica Hepburn, Gabby Vortier, a whole load of, load, loads of lovely, lovely people. And because I've done this and got involved and I wasn't expecting any of this, it's actually changed the way I think and feel. Um, and actually, I've stopped hating myself and I've stopped doing that man thing of blaming myself and feeling the guilt. And I've come to the realization it's just that's life. And sometimes things happen, um, sometimes good things happen, and sometimes bad things happen. Um, so, going back to the actual journey, and the whole point of um, not being able to talk, being able to fight, and being able to support. Um, there's one thing that's changed out of that. Um, actually, 
and I, I, this isn't, I didn't, I've just realised this as I'm looking at the painting. This is me, not me trying to be clever. I can't do clever, seriously. Just getting out, getting out of the beanbag's a problem for me. So I don't do clever, but there's a picture here and it's a Rembrandt. Um, and it's, it's not an actual Rembrandt. You know, if this was a proper Rembrandt, with respect, I would be sat out. I'd be in Barbados laying on a beach. Rembrandt, it's just a cheap copy. Do you know what I mean? Um, that I got from somewhere, legally. Right, it's a it's a Rembrandt and it's a painting called the uh, Anatomy of Lessons, Anatomy Lessons of Doctor Tulp, um, uh, and it's done by Rembrandt, and it's all about medical. Um, ironically, because it's fitting it together, just about um, lessons, and the lesson that I've learned out of this, just as a bloke, and I say this to, to women, not just blokes, but the lesson I've learned is that. Um, all that time of keeping it in and feeling guilt and feeling blame um, and that kind of old cultural thing of belief of not being able to talk. Between the talking, the guilt and the support, I can't do the support because she's gone. I can't do the fighting um, because she's gone. But what I have learnt, learnt to do uh, is I've learnt to talk. Um, and actually it's a good it's a good thing it's a good thing to talk it may not bring you solution but just by being able to talk about it is enough it's certainly done me the world of good um i do a lot of work with a daytime job um and one of one of those subject matters are mental health and there's a massive thing in mental health at the moment which actually with child's men um does have an effect, isolation, loneliness, depression, mental health. And, and often when I do these sessions, I'm out in front of people going, right, okay, lads, it's not a weakness at all, it's a strength. And sometimes I come away thinking that, thinking, well, you're just full of flannel, do you do that? And actually, I may not be perfect, but I'm actually doing it now. Um, and because I'm doing that, I don't feel the same as I did all those years ago. Um, I feel there is more to life ever within, um, that it is okay to talk about it. Um, and I'm not to blame. Um, so one thing I would say to everyone out there, all you lovely people, or whatever I'll chip you going through, especially when it comes to this, because I know how tough it is, I've been there with you. Um, talk, talking helps. As I say, it may not be the solution, but it, it, it does help. Um, I'm just an ordinary bloke. Um, as I say, we're all different. And this was just my journey. And I've got to take something away from it. Because if I don't take something, then what was it all about? Um, so I want to say to all your lovely people, whatever you're going through, um, I wish you all the best with it. And again, so I'm sounding repetitive now. I know how tough it is for you. Um, I want you to know that I'm I'm now, I'm now with you, and because of the things I've done, it, it's it, it's not perfect, but just getting something out of it is is an amazing thing, um, and I won't be here otherwise. I wouldn't be doing this now with the lovely Eva. Um, so I'm just going to shut up now because I'm waffling. I'm trying to do some kind of Jerry Springer number on you now and do something that's really clever, but I'm just going to end up sounding like a plonker, uh, which is ironic because my name's Rodney. So there you go. Um, so listen, everyone, uh, thank you for listening to me. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, thanks for giving up your time. And whatever journey you're on, um, I wish you all the elf. Come on, I'm looking over there. There's nothing over there. I wish you all... <laughs> All the health and happiness with your journey and um, go easy on yourself. And I'm going to pass you back to Eva now, um, the wonderful Eva. Um, she's a lot more intelligent, a lot more prettier. Um, and here she is. God bless you. So thank you very much, everyone. And look after yourselves. Over to you, Eva. Okay. I don't think I, I don't should think actually, Eva, I'll do this. Uh, I'll do it like a news presenter. Over to you, Eva. Okay, I, I don't think I can follow that one actually. But anyway, Rod, that was really, really interesting to hear. And one of the questions that sort of came to my mind while I was listening, um, I mean, it's a really powerful 
journey that you've been on and, and the way you describe it, especially the way you sort of gave us the three things that were your three values that totally yeah. were taken away and destroyed by facing up to your childlessness. Um, the question I want to ask is, when you meet people now, childless men now, and you encourage them to talk, do you often think that those that are at the real beginning of their journey aren't ready to talk and that they just need to listen? Or do you find that when people get the opportunity to speak to you for the first time that it just all comes out and you can't stop them talking because they've never really done that before and it all just, you know, flows out from them? Well, I think, um, it's a good question, Ev. I think um, three things that come about for me is one, and I'm sorry if this puts a bit of a, um, a, a pushback. I've rarely met, um, let alone childless men, I've, I've read, well, hold on, culture's changing. And I think young men are, are, are different to us old school boys. I think they're much more open, they talk, which is a great thing. Um, but in, in the first answer to that question, um, I've only met, um, probably two childless men and both of them could talk, which I was really, really chuffed about. Um, but maybe it's all, all, obviously, you know, where we're coming from, who we mix with. Um, I've rarely met childless men. I mean, I told you that, that tweet thing 10 years later, that was the first bloke I'd never, mm -hmm. I didn't know him in my life that had actually said, I, I ain't got a spell either. And I've just watched all film, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that came as a shock to me. Um, I think when you do open up the tap, you, without a doubt, Ev, I think blokes do want to talk. It's just when you've got all that, when you've culturally and when you're whoever depending on you are, uh, whoever you are depending, um, some books of blokes are brought, a lot of blokes are brought up to think you just can't, you can't do it, you can't talk. Mm -hmm. um, but I've noticed if you do ask a question, if you ask open questions, right questions, men, men and women are different, but. I think people want to be heard. They just need to be asked the right questions and it will come on. It will just come on. But as long as there's that, and you know this, Seth, the barriers and the culture of game, men, stay quiet, you don't deal with this, be support, um, then it's going to stay that way. But I think it's great because we're all doing something to make that happen. Yeah. I, and also, one more thing is I think this journey, I think this whole thing about child men and talking is starting now. I think it's almost brand new and I think it's starting now. Yeah, and I think Fertility Fest did quite a lot for that, didn't it? You know, yeah. I mean, you you were talking about it and Benjamin Zeff and I was talking about it. Um, and also um, people like Robin Hadley, the researcher yeah. about childless men, etc. And he himself, he, he, he described himself as an aging childless man. You know, he's getting on in years. He's, that's how he describes himself. Um, yeah. I definitely think there's much more of a, a narrative about it now. And uh, that was the lovely thing, Ed, both Robin and Benjamin. When I did the, uh, the fest with Benjamin, and I, obviously I've seen Robin since he's a mate, um, it's great because they're really open about it. They're really, really open about it. And I think the more men here, you know, lads like them talk, the better it is. It's progress. I think as well, it's finding the right people to talk to, isn't it? Because I think possibly if somebody does want to open up and they speak to the wrong person and therefore they get a response they weren't expecting that might make them clam up again, yeah. um, then it might actually prevent them from doing that again in the future with somebody else that would maybe be a bit more understanding. So it's finding the right people to talk to as well, isn't it? It is, it is ever. I mean, I did something recently with Jess, Jessica, Eppen, and, uh, and we were talking about this and it's, um, she was asking me and I said, I think it's just about understanding. I think the toughest thing is when, it, it, I don't know, it's like being black or white or straight or gay. It's like, I'm not saying you have to be that in order to understand, but there's just that kind of um, understanding the background of, of a journey that you've been through that just, um, helps you feel I can talk about is because you understand me. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It, it, and, and I think if, I mean, because I, I was talking about this the other day that is, I think there's this other thing ever that um, it's like when you try and talk about it, and certainly when I've tried years ago to do it, 
people can come out with those cliche answers. I'll come and there's more to life. I'll get on with it. And I always try to turn you into a bit of a victim. And I don't want to be a victim to no one because I ain't. And I think that just, I think those kind of pressures stops people from talking. Yeah. That actually they're just, it's tough for them and they just want to talk about it. But it's like, I don't, they don't think they can. Okay. Now, if somebody wanted to watch England Expects, the film that you made way back, about 10 years ago, um, I know I found it on um, the World Childless Week website. Is it, can you just Google it to find it? I mean, I do know it is on there if people want to have a look to see if it's on the World Childless Week one still. Um, but it's still available, yeah, it, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. If you put in, I, I, uh, I think ever, bearing in mind I'm a complete technophobe, I think it's like www.rod-silvers.co.uk or even if you put Rod Silvers, uh, rod-silvers.co.uk in Google, it will just, there's a web page, I've got a web page and the film's on now, um, okay. or it'll come up anyway. Okay, we've got some questions, so I'm putting my glasses back on to have a look at these. Okay. Oh, the, the, oh, talking about Stephanie's website, Will Child the Sweet website, I've got a lovely, lovely message for you from Stephanie Phillips saying, not a question, I just want to say, keep talking, Rod, you're making a difference to everyone who hears you. Isn't uh, that I tell you what, honestly, if she weren't married, I'd marry her tomorrow. Not <laughs> she's not I mean, she's not desperate enough, but I mean, she's a legend. She's a legend of a woman. Steph, I, um... I, I don't know what I'm waiting. Yeah, there. I'm waving there. Bless her. Thank you, Steph. You're, you're a legend. Absolute legend. Okay. She's... I've got. I've got another um, anonymous. Um, oh, Stephanie's waving back. She said, "I've got another anonymous comment." Oh, can I just say one other thing, Eva? Right. Uh, I've got to thank that lovely lady for helping me out to work out Twitter. Oh, she's brilliant, isn't she? She's a legend. Yeah. Oh. Oh, she's great with us as well. She's going to do a More to Life webinar for us as well. About oh, brilliant. World Child I'm top woman. So, I know, brilliant. Okay, another comment. Really entertaining, Rod. Thanks so much. Really enjoyed the session. Had a huge grin on my face throughout. You've cheered me up on this really miserable rainy oh. day. I, a question yeah. for you. No. How do you deal with the childless and the child-free divide so you know some oh, people are childless and some are child free that's a that is a brilliant question that really is a brilliant question i think um i i personally separate them um i think because you know i spoke to a woman i won't mention her name the other uh, day and and she's chosen to be child free and it was astonishing having now involved in this community just how many um, just how many layers there are, you know, to this. Because she was telling me that she chose child free. She was telling me what a hard time she gets because she just made a choice. And I thought, she shouldn't have to go through that if she chooses to be child free. Why not? It's her choice. As for the actual question, sorry, I'm kind of uh, digressing. Um, I don't, I separate, I just see it as two separate things. If you're childless, it's just a different journey of being child free and it's all about choice. And I think that's really important as well, Eva, because I think, you know, if people have got kids, that should be celebrated. Well, my, mate, my mates that have got kids, I think it's fantastic and it's great. I, I'm very practical about this. My thing's about, I'm childless because that was just meant to be. That's just the way it's meant to be. Um, and choosing not to have kids, I think it's just a choice. And I don't want to compare them or, mm. or, 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 or get into any blame about that. I just think it's a choice. So I don't know if that's a good answer or not, but I think it's just a choice. Okay, well, w with More to Life, um, More to Life is, is definitely, um, we do consider ourselves a community that is for the childless not by choice, or the yeah. childless by circumstance. Yeah. Um, so it's very much for people that would have liked to have children, but for whatever reason that it's not happened for them. And, and as you said, there are so many different stories that come with that. So many yeah. people in our community um, have lots of different reasons why, why they are either childless by circumstance, childless not by choice. Um, yeah. So that's how it goes. I'll just see if there's any more questions. 
Right, okay. I think that's all of the questions for now, but I did see that Stephanie did put your website on the chat as well, and she's also put her own website on there as well. So um, if anybody wants to have a look at those, they, they, can, they can go and have a look at that. Right, Rod, is there anything else that you would like to share with anybody? Yeah, I, I want to say this, that when you, like you just said about child is not my choice, child, I think, um, I, when I, it's now when I look back, you know, I wrote the film and, I, and I, I've written the play and, and they've been done. Um, I just want people to know that I really do feel for them. I really, really do. We're all journey. There's a lot of people that, that they've got a lot of grief out there. Um, and, and I can't tell you enough because I've, I've been with you all the way on that one. I have. And that uh, I just, um, I understand that really how difficult it difficult is because there is you know this you face your own mortality <clears throat> no kids and you know basically it ends here it ends here with us that don't have them um and the reason why i did that the the film and the play is because i, I generally want i keep i know she's come back to child's men but i genuinely want people to know that they're not alone yeah. Like that's the biggest message for me, darling. I just don't want people feeling that isolation, feeling, you know, there's no end to this. I, I just want people to know that they're not alone. That's, that's it, really. For okay, me. I, I've got another question for you. Sunday is Father's Day. How do you cope with that as a childless man? Um, I don't know if it's because I'm cold. Ev. I don't know if it's really because I'm cold, but um, even when I go back when it all happened um maybe looking back i might have thought mm, that's a bit rough but i don't know and i think it's a part of my upbringing is i don't stop to think about it for two reasons one if you stop to think about it for too long it could drive you nuts and secondly um i've got a real practical thing inside me that says right if something don't happen then get on with it i've got a real get on attitude with it um not that I'm saying I don't empathise with other men that do feel on the... I mean, even just recently, if there was an advert on TV about... And I think it's still on. Um, I'm looking over that way because the TV's over there, not because it's on, right? And uh, there's this advert with a bloke that's given up fags. He's given up fags. And you can't... I could see what was coming. And he's given up fags because he's got his little baby, right? And he's given all this, right? He's stopping fags. And I thought... Well, that, there's your reason. Well, good for you, son. Do you know what I mean? Well done, yeah. Well done. It's so when you talk about Father's Day, there are times when I think, oh, well, good for you. I mean, you notice it when you go out, like it's Father's Day and they're celebrating pubs and in the park. You can't help notice it when you're walking by on your own and you're thinking, hmm, right, okay, never mind. Um, yeah. But that's the thing, Ev. I like the advert, like Father's Day, I don't stop to think about it too long. And not because I'm, I'm going to fall apart, but more it's just like, I'm trying almost not to swear, by the way, Ed, because I'm a terrible... You're doing you do so. really well, thank you. You're doing yeah. really, really well yeah. with that. But I do sometimes, I'll just go, mm, maybe that's a bit of a pain. Um, and then I just get on with it. Just get on with it, that's what I do. Okay. Um, I, I find Mother's Day really painful. And yeah, cool. um, I find that I try to have my own agenda on Mother's Day. That's how I cope with it. I try to do something that I want to do. That's and, a good thing. And, and if I feel uncomfortable about family expectations for things that I need to do for Mother's Day, then I might make alternative arrangements and maybe, you know, if I feel pressured that we've all got to get together or something like that, I might take my mum out on another day and tell her that's your Mother's Day present or something like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, M Mother's Day and Father's Day can bring up all sorts of emotions for people that aren't even in the childless community because not everybody might have a mother and father anymore. So that it's, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult sort of celebration anyway. But I think for the childless community... With me, I just think that if you speak to the people around you about how you're feeling, and um, so you open the line of communications and you're really honest with the people that you really trust, I think it can be easier. 
Um, so I, I'm sort of hoping that this is cold, it's good to talk tonight, isn't it? I'm sort of hoping that if there's any men watching this that don't, that feel uncomfortable about any expectation that's put on them for Sunday or um, any feelings that it's going to churn up inside them, I'm kind of hoping that after listening to what you've said tonight about being able to talk a bit more, I would love to see them talking to the people that really matter to them and the people that they really trust about how they feel about it. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. You know how you said in your workshops, you say to people, it's, you, you know, it's actually more manly to talk than to yeah. hold things in. I'm sort of hoping that people that have listened to your message tonight for Father's Day, that might give them the strength to do that. And that might be the first time that they actually try to do that rather than yeah. keep it all in. Well, that's a fact. Well, first of all, I want to say to you, at self because I think that's a great thing to do, you know, cope mechanisms, coping mechanisms and, and doing something positive and proactive for yourself. Cause you're still, a, doesn't change anything. You're still an amazing woman. But that doesn't change anything. And I love the fact you do that. And I think we've all got different ways of, of how we handle this. When going back, like if, we, if when I do the mental health stuff, it's amazing. I will talk, say to all those men out there, especially on Sunday, if they do, you know, mm. if they do find it difficult. I, I've sat with, I've sorry, stood up doing facilitation with construction workers. The hardest, I mean, our tough as now, now is men. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. big geezers, honestly. Honestly, that seriously, their arms are bigger than my body. That's how hard <laughs> they are, right? And, and they're sat there and they walk into a room and I go, oh, what's this about? talking what's all this about and by the end of it i've had at least five or six blokes that have come up to me and i've said it's it's a strength to talk not a weakness come up to me and said yeah. thanks but for 20 years 30 years um, because they thought they couldn't and actually they have had an issue but they've just never had the forum or outlet uh, to have that kind of narrative where they can say to other men or other people like you're saying yeah you know yeah. A bloke sat in a restaurant with all his family, blah, blah, say, you know, I tell you what, I just want to say something. This is how I feel, you know. And so when I go back to that mental health thing, it's, it's so empowering to see men do that. Yeah. But I think we've got to get rid of this taboo of men don't talk and actually it's just okay to do that. And that people that listen allow people to do that. Yeah. And I know that as a man that didn't used to talk there, honestly, genuinely, that was told it is just the weakness and it ain't. Aim. all we're doing is talking it's not going to hurt anyone is it no definitely not right i'm just looking on here again i'm listening to you i'm just looking on no, here i'm just rambling i'm just rambling all right what do you have planned next rod are there any more productions regarding childlessness yeah what i'm what i'm um well, what I'm hoping to do, because we uh, did Terry and Jude, um, and because, as, thank you for the question, by the way, because um, I'm in my 50s, and I'm getting older now, yeah. Um, <laughs> seriously, you laugh, I want your Brad Pitt, and I've got armpit, look at his face. Right, so, um, Ev, what I'm hoping to do is just because there's all these things happened. Am I allowed to mention a radio show that I'm doing at the moment? Yeah. Right. Um, so one of the things that came out of... Um, the Barbican is, uh, uh, I got, uh, there, there's quite a few things actually, Ev, but one of the things is a, a radio producer, a Radio 4 producer, um, called me, and we're currently recording a programme called My Name Is, and it's, uh, if you Google it, it's on Radio 4, and anyway, for some unknown reason, she was mad enough to want to do it about me, and we've interviewed Jessica Eppburn, we've interviewed Robin Adley, we're interviewing a senior consultant next week, um, which is great because more than anything else, and I genuinely mean this, it, it is from just the blokes, all new blokes point of view, I just want to push it. Part of the reason doing that is because I'm hoping, depending on all kinds of things, that I'm going to put the play on again. That's my ambition. Yeah. I want to tell you. And then also, um, I'm kind of writing a one man show about it. I've decided to just really grab the ball by the horns. Um, and actually, really, ever, really, really, this is why I'm grateful to you and grateful to everyone um, to really grab the ball by the horns and, and do this, like, almost, 
like the thing I did at the Barbican where I met you, to do it proper and really tell it as it is. Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping to do two things. It's a one-man show and I'm hoping to get Terry and Duke back on. I'm hoping. Well, if you, if you get Terry and Duke back on, I want to come and see it this time, if I can. Oh, I'd love but it. I haven't seen it, so I, I, I want to try and get... If it's going to be... Do you think it'll be touring or will it just be down in London? I'm hoping we're going to tour it. That's okay. genuinely what, because that's the other thing, Ever. So I don't want it to just be this, you know, all, all, <clears throat> excuse me, everything in London. There's a message out, and I want to take it out. I want to take it out to blokes around. That's the only way you're going to get a message is getting it out there. So I'd love to have a tour it and go up north and go south, and and so that men see it because that two percent of men saw it, and I want more men to see it so that at least they know those men that can't talk they can see something um, where the message is out there. And hopefully they find it funny, because we do, it's funny as well, I think. Yeah. Says it. Right, Says I've, it. Got, I've got another really lovely comment for you, which is here, here to you for cheering up another listener on this chilly grey evening. Oh, I've got you. a really good question to oh, finish wow. off, which is how do I, as a woman, get my partner to open up to me? That is the million-dollar question, isn't it? Oh, sorry, I think I had the doorbell go. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> no. um. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's, uh, that's difficult. Um, I almost kind of want to talk to this lady to ask her something. It's very difficult because um, you, you, obviously you want to be very careful as well. I don't say something um, um, that... It is inappropriate. Um, it's an idea. Um, tell him to watch a film. Because the truth is, ever to this lovely lady, whoever she is, um, you can't fool someone to talk. They've got to be able to want to do it, you know. I'm sure she's doing an amazing job trying to get him to talk and open up. But you can't, can't open up a man unless he reflects you reflects on what you know because there's so much ever and to this lovely lady you know this particular situation charts men you know to the women out there in particular and depending on what kind of bloke it is it, it is such a hard thing to do it's such a hard thing even to open up to your lovely wife because of all that stuff you feel as a man that um you should be doing and can't do. Uh, let me quickly say, when, when I was in the IVF clinic, when I was with, with my wife at the time, I remember it was in Hammersmith and we had all these sofas and couples sat on these sofas. And I'm very much generalising now, Ev, but what I noticed that all the women were trying to talk to their, to their partners, the men. Um, and, and you can see that they were, they were going through their own journey. And all the men were like this. And it was almost the unison, how the hell did I end up here? How could this possibly happen to me? And I kind of noticed it because just I love to watch things. And it was almost like all the blokes were saying, I don't want to do all this. I don't want to do all this. I don't want to be here. And all I can say to that lovely ladies, keep trying, get them to maybe listen to other men, you know, like Benjamin, like Robin, like the film. And maybe, okay. maybe you just... <laughs> Because that's the big thing, Ever. I think men feel quite isolated and I think they think quite alone. And that whatever she's doing is an amazing job, but maybe try to get him to listen to other things and, and, and like, or maybe watch a film, whatever. I don't understand that I'm promoting the film, do you know what I mean? But just no, something. I, I know, I know. But any, any sort of thing that they can watch to know that they're not alone, that other people have felt the same way as them, etc. Um, yeah, because as I said, Ev, I generally yeah. haven't met a lot of men that talk about this. I've met Toe, I've met Benjamin, Robin, and the geezer that tweeted me. Yeah. So maybe that gentleman's actually thinking, well, as Robin, one in four couples are affected, and more men are affected by childlessness than women. And I wonder, is that gentleman just one of those many men that are just sat there thinking, I don't know what I don't know what to do here. I just really don't. I, I love me, Mrs. I've got nothing. I bet it's not even to do with her. It's more like, how do I deal with this as a bloke? So hats off to her for trying, but there are forms and there are narratives that maybe she can say, whatever butchers at this. Yeah, yeah, definitely. 
Well, Rod, I think that's all. That for that young lady. Yeah, Good. definitely, definitely. I think that's all we've got time for. I've got a little bit of housekeeping to do. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you again to Rod. That was absolutely brilliant. And we no, had you. a really, really interesting discussion there. And, and I just genuinely hope that it has made men think about who they can talk to and, and how they can talk and make them appreciate that they're not alone. Um, we do hope to have the recording of this webinar available, but it might take a bit longer because some of our key staff are on holiday. But I will send out my usual message on social media when the recording's available on our website for you to watch. Um, we're hoping to have our next MTL webinar on Tuesday the 9th of July. Um, and again, you just register in the usual way on our website. Um, and again, I'll put out messages on our social media. So the website is www.fertilitynetworkuk.org. Now, because of our current data protection laws, we can only send reminders for webinars if you send me an email asking for reminders. So if you'd like to receive one, just email me heather at fertilitynetworkuk.org and ask for an MTL webinar reminder, and I'll send you all the details about that. Um, we won't share your data with any other organisation, we'll only use it for the purpose stated and it will, will be kept on file for the duration of the 2019 webinar series and can be removed at any time. But I'm nearly finished the housekeeping but there's one more thing that I want to say tonight while I've got men on here, okay? And that is we have on our website Finding More to Life, a self-help guide that was put together with Cardiff University. So Fertility Network UK worked with Cardiff University and it is specifically for people with unmet parenthood goals. Now Beth, a lovely lady from Cardiff University, is doing an, an acceptability study on that. Um, and basically what she wants to do is evaluate it. So she's looking for some men to take part in the study, which I think will involve a few phone calls with Beth, etc. And you may be eligible for a £50 voucher if you take part in this. So if you are interested in helping Beth out with her research, which is aimed at actually making the um, self-help guide even better for people to use it, please email her at rowbottom, so that's R-O-W-B-O-T-T-O-M, B, row bottom B at cardiff.ac.uk um, and she will get in touch with you. If you didn't pick that up and it all sounded like a garbled message, just email me and I'll send the details on to you. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty much all we've got time for. But again, I want to say a big thank you to everybody who's tuned in to watch this tonight. Another big thank you to the amazing Rod, who, as I say, had a really busy day and still managed to get here for us. So a huge thank you for that. And um, I just, I, I love your work, Rod. I love the way you, you speak to people. I love your honesty, everything about you. A really huge thank you from more to life. Well, can I say to you, young lady, thank you and take you out of all this amazing work you're doing, all right? Because oh, if you don't do this, it wouldn't be happening. So hats off to you. Oh, and you're a lovely woman and all. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And as I say, I do want to come and see the play. If it, if it tours again, you need to let me know because I want to come and see it. Okay. Oh, I'll get it on. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And we'll see thank you all right. later. Night, everybody. Night. Night. Do I press a button? I can't. <laughs>